Good evening YouTube and welcome to episode 4 of Project S2000. Now this video progress is really starting to come on now. So join me on this episode where we talk about everything that's been done this weekend and like I say really chuffed with the outcome. My name is James Stone and welcome to Project Rust Bucket S2000. So as mentioned in the previous videos the catalyst has been removed. I bought a decat pipe but the value in the catalyst in the S2000, 700 pounds, like for an old catalyst, I just couldn't believe it. So with the 30 pound decap purchased, it was finally time to get it on. Now I have got a slight snag, the old kit that came off, the fitting kit was all rusted, so I had to cut it. I had a spare kit that's not for a Honda S2000 I put on for the time being, just to make sure everything was all right, but I have ordered now a new kit, which will hopefully be fitting in the next video. So as it been a couple of months since the car had been started, it made sense to obviously check the oil, check in the dipstick, oil nice and gold, which is always good to see. Previous owner did say he did regular oil changes and I'll come back to this later in the video when we remove the rock cover. But essentially check the level was okay, fired it all up, and as you saw in the intro, this is how it sounded. bit disappointed with the noise to be honest with you from the exhaust a little bit raspy a little bit I don't know just at the top it just sounded a bit not right not what the noise that I wanted to hear I was hoping it was going to sound like Matt's one with the UK mod and the catalyst fitted but obviously standard back box but it's just yes yeah, as you can probably hear it sounds worse in the video not 100% happy with it but like I say hopefully with the revised intake it'll all be induction noise anyway but if it's that bad i will have to change the standard system obviously when we get it out on the road firing it up just on the driveway you never really get an idea of how it's going to sound until it's under load so in the second video i think it was of the car i decided to play around with the standard airbox now the standard airbox works really well seems to deliver good results drawback is you don't get any of that wonderful vtec noise crossover which as you've seen in Matt's video and my video, it just sounds great when it hits 6,000 RPM. And for me, it's as close as you're gonna to get to a two-stroke motorcycle with that aggressive power band. And being able to hear that from the intake really enhances the whole experience. version I built sheet alley open the top of the airbox sort of looked at it kept coming back to it wasn't particularly happy with it so peeled all the gold tape off took the airbox lid back still kept it with the open design with the heat shield so I'm not going to get any heat soak and then just painted it all black because I wanted to go with like a more OEM factory finish but again still didn't like the idea of this heat shield thing running down the front the theory was that it would pick cool air up, obviously bring it to the front of the air box, hopefully improve the cold air intake temperatures because the standard opening is right behind the radiator. So obviously in standing traffic, that heat's just going to rise, go straight into the intake. Seems a bit odd for a car of that level of tuning. But obviously Honda knows something I don't know. But for me, it didn't make sense to have that opening there. So I thought, why not do what I did with one of my Clio's years ago? Put a knacker duct on the bonnet. Now, as I said, it's not a collectible car, it's never going to be an original low mileage. So for me, I was like, let's get the angle grinder out. Let's uh, cut the bonnet open and put a big knacker duct on there. And hopefully, like I say, improve the VTEC noise further. Get nice cold air intake temperatures because it's going to run straight off the bonnet. A lot like the Teguari kit that I had on the EP3 that had a bonnet scoop. So I thought, you know what, let's do it. I'm committed. And... Nice to see that it's an alley bonnet, so some weight saved there. I believe after researching it, they're all alley bonnets, but I wasn't sure at first. I thought it might have been steel, but cut it all open using a template I've made up, bonded all of the uh, knacker ducts in place so it's not going to go anywhere. And like, it's hard to see from this video, but basically it feeds straight into the airbox. So it's like a secondary air intake on top of the original front one, which hopefully, even when you're not moving, you'll just pull fresh air straight from outside. And when you're moving, it will pressurise the airbox to, in theory, give it a 
ram air sort of effect on there. So excited to see how that's gonna sound, really happy with how it all came together. And like I said in the last video, that Nappy Act was just a fiberglass one. It's about 15 pounds delivered, I think it was. So not a lot of money at all, but really excited to see how it looks, obviously when it's on the road, because it does completely change the look of the car now with it having that big opening on there. So the standard cat back exhaust for me, yes, there are lighter options. Yes, there's gonna be options out there that make more power, but I really don't want it to be boomy. I don't like the aftermarket tips on a lot of the systems. So I thought, if this does sound okay or quiet enough on the road with the standard back box, gonna need to do something about the exhaust tips. They looked pretty tired, like mud had burned onto them. I'm not a big fan of chrome exhaust tips, something I wanna change on the E92 M3 at some stage, but I thought, you know what? I've got like, it's like a sanding, it's like a Brillo pad, but it's actually a body shop one with like a 500 grit, and I thought I'd take some of that to it, scrub it back and try and make like a brushed finish. And I was actually really happy with the results I got from that, like I said, it also cleaned it up and it took away the chrome. So for me now, rear exhaust tips look really nice in the bumper. Just need to see how it's gonna sound, obviously, with that decap pipe on there. Because the standard exhaust is really quiet, and I liked that. I'm not fussed for exhaust noise from the VTEC engine. I just want the intake sound, but obviously fitting that decap has increased it. So we'll see when it's eventually on the road, if I can live with it. The headlights, again, 21-year-old car. They just were looking an absolute state. Really faded, really like glazed over. And obviously, I have got the Xenons on there. Seems for the JDM car that you don't need the Xenon washers, so it's quite a clean look on the front, but every time I looked at it, I thought, yeah, that's gonna need some TLC. So two and a half thousand wet and dry paper, scrubbed it all back, there was like green slime that was running off of it as I was sanding it, and then just went through the polishing compounds with my DA polisher, and it's like a different light. It really modernizes the car, especially as it was looking so tired on the front end. And like I say, for an hour's work, really happy with how they've come out now. So with that done, it was then on to actual the bodywork of the car. Now, it looks like the previous owner or the owner before that had unfortunately driven through maybe some like white emulsion paint, it was specks of it all down the side, all in the arch liner. The good news is getting it out of the arch liner was easy because you could just pressure wash it. I wasn't worried about any paint damage because it's a plastic trim that, to be honest with you, the way the rears are, I'll probably just remove anyway. But went ahead, pressure washed it out the arches and then went to clay in all the door and the rear quarter where I had these little specks and obviously white paint on a black car. You can't really see it in the video. It hasn't really come up, I don't think, but it was something that I would see every time I'd wash it or when it was clean. So pleased to report, clay barred all around the car, managed to remove all the white dots on there. And like I say, pulled a lot of grime off the paintwork as well. Unfortunately, I didn't get any footage of the clay bar, but for those that have seen it, like clay bars on an old car, quite satisfying. But the paint now looks like it really needs a good polish. Being black, it's just showing up every imperfection. Something that I hadn't thought about when I was out there at the weekend working on it, is I did promise myself I'd never buy a black car again, because as soon as you wash it, the following day, dust settles on it, marks, everything shows. But when clean, it is one of the best colors, and it really suits the S2000, really sharpens it, makes it a lot more aggressive looking. So. Looking forward to seeing how it's gonna be when I finally get the car fully polished. Moving on to the interior. Now, the gear knob on the S2000 on my one, there's a lot of scratches on it, had loads of little micro dents, looks like a ring or something had been worn while changing gear, and it's done 150 plus thousand miles, so you expect these things, unfortunately, just to start getting a little bit tired. The interior overall is pretty clean. It's not a pristine interior, but it has come a long way, obviously, since I cleaned everything leather cleaned all the steering wheel and that's come up really well which is nice i was originally going to retrim that but i think for what the car is i'm happy to leave that for the time being i did think about a black alcantara red stitching which would look nice but i think i need to change that steering wheel for something that's maybe dish to bring it back towards me at a later date but while i was in the interior i thought you know what i need to address that gear knob i could go and buy one for 20 25 pounds black one, quite neutral with the rest of the car, black and red theme that I'm going with. But then I thought, you know what, if I take it off, find a thread in the garage, and I think it was like a 10 mil thread, might be an eight mil thread, cut the head off a bolt, wound the gear knob onto it, put the other end of the thread into the drill. And I thought, if I get some wet and dry, put it in the drill, spin it around, take off or sand it back, remove the dents, the scratches, see how it looks. If it doesn't work out, it's 25 pound for a new gear knob. Not a genuine one, just a replica one of, I don't know, like a museum one or something in the black. But 
really, really happy with the results, especially as I say, another hour just tinkering away, which I really do enjoy on the driver. I love just playing with the car and really impressed with how that came out. Like I say, for no real cost other than some wet and dry and uh, just putting it in the drill for half hour, really pleased with the end result on that. Another thing that I knew I needed to address was the SRS light, which I believe is safety restraint system. So seat belts, potentially airbag, buckles and all that are all tied into that system. I thought, God, if it's anything like the BMWs or the Renaults, it's gonna need a really like hardcore hardware software to be able to reset that. So put it in YouTube, like most, you look for your problem, it's the easiest way to find it now. And it came up, S2000 SRS reset light. So my light had been on the dash, Owner had told me this, so I thought, yeah, gonna have to turn it off for the MOT when it eventually gets done. And it is so simple. There's literally a dummy cable under the dash. You link it out, turn the ignition on, wait for the light to flash, pull it out, wait for it to flash, put it back in, turn it on, turn it off, and it resets it. So if you have got a permanent fault there, it's not gonna get rid of it, but if something's happened, cables got loose, battery upset, or something like that, it's really easy. There's a guide on YouTube, and it literally is like a minute and a half, and now, Thankfully, SRS lights off. So slowly getting through those little jobs, they are time consuming, as you can imagine. You keep doing another thing, another thing, it seems to lead on to something else. But the airbag light is off, it illuminates on ignition on, and then turns off, which means it's all working correctly. And zero cost to resolve, so really happy with that. Moving on to the boot floor. So the boot floor stroke toolkit area, as I discussed in the last video, it was rusted, it's made of steel, it's heavy, never gonna put a toolkit in it again. Decided it was time to take the grinder to it. So literally just went around with the grinder, cut it out really quickly, <laughs> whole boot floor out. And like I say, I'm gonna eventually plate that, seal it, rivet, something maybe like a two or three sheet meal alley in there. So nothing too hardcore, because there's gonna be no weight in there, so it doesn't need to be particularly strong just enough that obviously water can't get into the boot and when you look underneath it, you're not looking obviously into the inside of the car. So that'll be on the next video. I've dropped, like I say, the boot well out. I'm gonna make a template, cut it all down, put it in there and hopefully just get that all under sealed under there. So from underneath, it all just looks completely factory. So when I picked up the car with Matt, we got back to his house as in the intro video, gave it a good wash and Matt also plugged it into his OBD reader and it came back, unfortunately, as that secondary air pump. Now, the secondary air pump on most cars, including the S2000, is purely for the startup to make sure that the catalyst gets up to temperature as quickly and as cleanly as possible so the car emits perfect emissions, even from cold. So obviously there was an issue with the electric pump that's in the car and didn't have a catalyst anymore. So for me, didn't need to be in there. Research online again through the S2000 Owners Club, which if you bought one of these cars, I'd strongly recommend getting on there. It's full of information. And I thought, you know what? We'll just bin the whole system. Save another five kilos, not gonna need it. Removing um, off the inlet manifold, there's like a solenoid vacuum valve on there. You need to just make a blanking plate for it. There's a kit they sell, I think it's about $50, $60 from what I saw, but I was gonna have to wait from America. And I thought, you know what? I can build this myself. It's not gonna be difficult. So using the old gasket, made a template, cut it all out, bolted it all in, fired the car up, make sure there was no leaks. Absolutely perfect. So yeah, that in itself was a nice little job. And then it's just a case of removing all the pipe work, runs down by the coolant hoses, and it's in the front left, so the passenger side arch is all the secondary air pump. So that all came out as well. The issue you've then got is the car knows there's no pump there. So it puts up the engine management light, which I already had from the pump being faulty. And I'll put the resistor rating in, but I think it was a 25 watt, 20 ohm resistor, and just basically took the resistor, soldered a cable to it, soldered some tabs to it, made my own little sort of homemade resistor. And now it's just a case of plugging it in, resetting that light, and fingers crossed, no more issues with the secondary air pump and a good five kilo weight saving. So at this point, I was now stripping the engine down, decided to take all the auxiliary belt off. And for me, whenever the belt's off, always have a quick spin of the pulleys, just make sure everything's okay. So obviously the crank pulley, you can't really free spin because it's got the whole rotating assembly of the engine on there. Water pump, span that, absolutely lovely, feels nice and tight. Span the idler, okay, I'd say it would have passed. And then I span the tensioner bearing.
So as you can hear in that driveway shot, even with all the cars in the background, that bearing is absolutely shot. So again, looking online, loads of helpful information, seems they fail quite often. And went on the Facebook group, put the video up, and loads of people came back saying, I think it was Jap, Jap Service Parts, I'll put the link in the video. Um, absolutely brilliant, ordered it, and it arrived the following day. Can't fault the service. So two new bearings, they were 4 dollars each. Um, they're a Japanese brand, not genuine Honda. And like I say, little jobs like that that can be solved because if the aux belt was to come off, you'd lose the water pump, you'd lose the alternator charge. It could really ruin a day out or a track day for the sake of 10 pounds. So got all those ordered and like I say, arrived in record time. So as the air conditioning system had no gas in it, it wasn't working when I picked it up, the aircon radiator looked like it was pretty tired, it was falling apart. I was still left with a large bulky aircon pump in there. So I thought, well, I've got to take the alternator off to get access to it. Might as well remove all the aircon pump while we're here. And I thought, as the alternator's off, I can then wash the engine bay. Now, for me, I've had bad luck with alternators. I had one fail on my E46 M3. I had one fail on the Gixxer 600, my motorbike. And I had one fail on the E92 M3. And I haven't washed any of those engine bays. So it's not that I've got poor technique. I've just been really plagued with bad alternators over the years. And I thought, you know what, I'll take it all off and I'll leave it off so there's no chance of water getting into there. And then I can give the engine bay a good degrease, get into all those gaps. The rocker cover paint just continued to flake off. But even after the deep clean, really happy with how the engine bay was starting to look. So as I was degreasing, I used the engine bay cleaner from Auto Glean. Really love it. It's really simple. Doesn't seem too aggressive. Doesn't stain any of the plastics and lifts grease off really easy. So I had some little agitating brushes. Went around and did everything. And I couldn't believe how much oil was on the front of the block. But like dried oil that had been there for some time. And I thought, rocker cover doesn't look like it's leaking. But I was like, must be. Must be coming from the rocker cover for it to drip down on the front of the block. But we'll come back to that in a little bit. So degreased all that, like I said, with the Auto Glean Cleaner, left everything to dry, and then it was time to remove all the rocker cover. Now, it's one of those things, 150,000 miles, I was expecting to lift it off and just see black tar everywhere. So previous owner, Lewis, like I say, said he did all his own oil services, didn't really have any receipts, so I sort of took it as, there's probably not any receipts or servicing paperwork to actually back it up. Just gonna to have to assume that it's gonna need a good service and hopefully after a few oil changes with myself, it'll then be nice and clean. Lifting the rocker cover off, wow. I mean, he certainly wasn't lying. For over 150,000 miles, I've seen engines with 30, 40K that don't look as clean as that. So real nice, pleasant surprise to see it's lovely and golden in there and all the cams, the followers, everything looks pristine, no scoring, nowhere. So for me, if the cylinder heads like that, pistons and everything, conrod, bearings, I'd like to think everything down on that department is perfect as well. Fingers crossed anyway. So while it was all apart, obviously I needed to repaint the rocker cover. One, it looked really nasty. And two, every time I touch it, bits of it were flaking off going into the engine bay, which was just making it look a mess. So the top plate, the black part, had no flake in it. It actually looked really good. So I thought, you know what, I'll just give that a quick sand over with a sanding block with some, I think it was 1600 wet and dry, and then just degrease that, put it to one side. And like I say, in the clip I'll overlay now, I was actually really happy that I didn't need to paint that and how well it all came out. So it was then on to the big job, which is the rocker cover. Now, the paint on mine was flaking off in most places. So I've got a good wire brush. I had some, I think it was some 200 grit sandpaper just to get into all the gaps and corners that the wire brush couldn't reach. And it took, it just seemed to take ages. And then towards the end, there was bits left on there that weren't flaking, they weren't loose. And I thought, do I get the nitromores out? Start mucking about with that. And then I thought, if I get nitromores on there, I'll have to make sure it's 100% decontaminated because if I start painting and any of that nitromores is still on there, I thought I could take it into work, put it in the wash there and get it all done. I thought, you know what? I'll break away all the loose paint that's detailed here, mask it all up, put down the high temperature wrinkle paint, which I've used on the Clio before, really good stuff. And for the sake of 15 quid, if it doesn't work out, I'll have to do it again. Pleased to report that after masking everything up, putting a couple of coats down, 
looks absolutely fantastic. Backlight factory again, and more so not just for the look, but the old paint flaking off and ending up in parts of the engine bay were gonna no longer be an issue for me on this one. So with that done, I then started looking at, I think they're called like the radiator securing brackets, two small ones on the front of the engine bay. Mine were looking really rusty, really tired, and I thought, well, if I'm going with a black and red theme, why I brush it all up, give them a coat as well. So they've got a little wrinkle effect to them, looks really tidy in the engine bay. Like I say, for another 10, 15 minutes while I already had the paints out on the bench, made sense to tie it all in for a quick job and hopefully prevent any corrosion further down the line. So before putting the rocker cover back on, it made complete sense to do the valve adjustments. Now I found the guide from Honda, I found again an owner's club guide on the valve adjustments and the tolerances. And I went with more the tighter side and I thought, you know what, we'll check it all, adjust it all, it makes sense while it's apart. The engine sounds absolutely sweet anyway, so I didn't think it was gonna be far out. Put the inlet one in, absolutely perfect. All of them rotating through, didn't need any adjustment at all. And then I did the exhaust side. Now I used the larger size of the sort of adjustment tolerance and it was going in, but it was just a little bit tight. So I went back into the garage, grabbed, I think it was the 0.25 millimeter feeler gauge, which is still within tolerance. And again, everything fitted perfectly. So either the valves have been adjusted recently or at least within the sort of last 10, 20, 30K, or this car has had a very easy life, which from when I opened it up to the first time and watched the soot come out the back of it, as though Lewis, previous owner, was just using it as a runaround, I think it's had a pretty easy life for the past couple of years. So yeah, thankfully, really nice and straightforward, didn't need to make any adjustment. So on went the rocker cover, put it all back together. So with the OG spell now all obviously in bits, engine bay clean, it was time to put everything back together. Now I had the old pulleys off, bearings were absolutely shot, like in a really bad way. You could feel it when they were off the car by hand, just how sort of grunchy they were, really not nice. So nice and straightforward, couple of sockets, knocking them out, there's like a taper on one side, so you have to use a slightly smaller size to smash them out, and like I say, the bearing gets destroyed doing it that way anyway, but all came out, cleaned everything up in there, gave the face of the pulley a repaint, because it had a load of rust on it, and then top tip for pushing the new bearings back in, Keep your new bearings nice and cold. You can put them in a bag in the freezer, but it's cold enough out that I just left them on the bench. Heat gun on the pulley, get it nice and hot, and that'll just cause that ever so slightly to expand. And I managed to put the bearing in the vise, just wind it by hand with no real pressure. New bearings in, did the same for both. The only thing you need to be really careful of is when you're pressing the bearing in that you're pressing on the outer steel, not the seal or the inner one, because you can damage the new bearing. And like I say, Jap, I think it was Jap, I'll put the link up, the company I bought them from, I ordered them, and they just arrived so quickly, brilliant. There's nothing worse than when you're in the middle of a project and you end up waiting weeks and weeks for parts, which like I say, we've had with Olin's obviously now up to 11 weeks, but I'm told they're coming next week now. But with these guys, following day, everything back in, also gave the sort of washers a sand down and a quick paint up because they were looking a bit corroded just to keep it looking sort of clean with the theme now with the rocker coven being all nice and again i'll put a video overlay in that's how new bearings should sound Lastly, it was then on to putting the new Augs belt on. Obviously, as the aircon pump had now been deleted, you don't need any additional pulleys, just a shorter one. I will double check it, but I think it was a 6PK, so a 6-track, 11.45 length. All tensioned up perfectly. It's about £10 for the belt, so not a lot of money at all. So we've got a new belt on there because the old one was really perished. New bearings in all the pulleys and aircon deleted. So... Revs up lovely and sharp now, even less rotating mass on the auxiliary setup, and hopefully no failures or issues for the next couple of years now. Moving round to the secondary air pump. So as I mentioned, I'd done the plate, did the pipe work, but I still actually had the electrical unit and I needed to get a resistor in there. So I thought, well, the splitter, for those that saw in the intro video, was all cracked in a really bad way. And I thought, I'm probably gonna have to replace this, but with the ride height I'm gonna be running, I'll try and patch it up. So I'll take it all off, take the front bumper off. What should have been, like always, 10 minutes to remove, just turned into half hour, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour. The top bolts in the slam panel, 
all rounded off. I was even using an impact driver to try and get them out. Because once I'd rounded the first one off, I thought I'd get the smasher and put a twist into it. Nothing. So I ended, unfortunately, having to grind all those off. Thought that would then be a case of just going underneath and undoing the 10 mils along the bottom of the bumper. All of those seized in the brackets. Unfortunately, if it being a coastal car, like you've seen from the rust, it had also eaten a lot of the bolts. Bizarrely, not so much in the engine bay, but the front bumper, I just fought everything. Swearing at the car on the driveway, neighbors again, thinking I'm going stir crazy. But eventually got all that removed, and then I was greeted by the secondary air pump. So you can now see the secondary air pump unit and all the pipe work. Again, pretty straightforward, two 14 mil bolts to remove the pump assembly leaving all the solenoids and everything with the electrical one on the 10 mil bracket all left alone. Once the pump's out, you then just simply plug your resistor in. And lucky enough, I followed a guide using the spade connectors. Realistically, I probably should have just cut the plug off and soldered straight to it. because I thought it's never gonna have a secondary air pump in again. It's never gonna be an original car, but it's done now. With it being worried about the connectors potentially falling out, bumpy road, rumble strips, bits like that, I thought I'll just put a tie wrap around it, pin it all together, keep it in place, turn the ignition on, resistor gets warm, which means it's obviously working, that's why it's got the little heat, shrink, like heat shield on it. And yeah, just now a case of clearing the engine light, saved five kilos, no longer got that noisy pump in there, and fingers crossed that uh, check engine management light doesn't come back anytime soon. So, Everything back together, broker cover done, valve adjustments checked, still need to do the oil filter and service, have got the filter, just need to go and pick up the oil. Thought, fire it up, let it get all up to temperature, make sure the belt's tracking correctly, and that the rocker cover's not leaking. Fired the car up, left it idling for 10 minutes, opened up a few revs, and then I started to see a little oil weep, and not from the rocker cover. So, it's the front bolt on the top of the cylinder head, just had an ever so slight weep and I was like, that's where my oil was leaking from. That's why the front of the block was staining because it was just starting to mist. And I looked at it and I thought, is this gonna be taking all the cams out, cylinder head off to replace the ceiling there? I thought this could end up being an absolute nightmare of a job. But again, the S2K owners club comes to the rescue. The guide on there advised that you wind it out just enough that you can get the O-ring off. Now, if you wind it out too far, you're in a lot of trouble. Pulleys are going to fall off. That is going to be a head apart. So very carefully cracked it off, wound it all the way out. You could see the O-ring was really perished. Got a knife, cut the O-ring, went to my box of universal O-rings, little bit of a tight fit, got it over, put it back in. And the most important thing was the torque set. And I think it was 35 foot pounds, which is about 50 or 55 newton meters. The guide said, if you fail to torque that up correctly, disaster is likely to occur. So double, triple torque checked it, new O-ring all in place, fired it up again, left it running for 10 minutes, no oil leak. So it's nice when little jobs like that come together, especially as like I say, it's obviously been an issue for some time of it weeping out and staining all the front of the block, but hopefully now no further oil leaks and that engine bay can stay nice and clean. So finally, with the bumper all off, gave everything a good clean behind there put it back on, put some new bolts in, got some new bolts for the lower section, and then I took the splitter into the garage and I thought, do you know what, I've got some fiberglass stroke carbon fiber resin, I'll patch it up. So I ended up filling all the crack in, sealing it all back, sanding it back, and I've just put the same sort of black and clear coat to give it the same sort of satin finish as the fender. So it all sort of ties in, I guess, with a wide arch kit. And the reason I didn't want to go and spend another 120, 150 pounds on another replica splitter is the car is going to be low. I'm almost certain I'm going to smash this one to bits again. So I thought this happened with the previous owner on the standard ride height. I'm definitely going to end up wiping this out. So I thought if I patch it up, it looks half decent for now, it'll do the job. So really happy with how that's coming together. I haven't got a lot of video footage of that because I literally was finishing it up last night near enough in the dark. That's it for this video. Obviously, still plenty more to go. Got to build the boot floor template. Got to repair the smashed mirror that was on the right-hand side that was all duct taped together. But as hopefully you guys can see, it's almost exceeding my expectations on how good it was looking. I knew it was never going to be terrible, and I also knew it was never going to be pristine or a collector's car or anything like the Cup, the 172 that I've got. But I'm at that stage now where I'm itching to get it finished. Progress is really moving forward. Still need to get the coilovers, still need to polybrush everything. 
there's still lots of work to do. So stay tuned, guys. Obviously, if you're enjoying the video, please give us a like and a subscribe. And if you've got any input that you think I should be doing or you want to see or any questions, just let me know in the comment section. Thanks for watching, guys. Until next time.